Well, good morning again. Uh, we're starting a series. We actually started it last week, a new series called Next. You know, 20, about 20 years ago, a group from Missoula Alliance Church uh, banded together under the leadership of Pastor Jeff Valentine, and many of you know, uh, to plant a church across town on this north end of town. And uh, so we're just taking some time to say, what might the next 20 years look like? We're in this time of transition, of, of looking to a new future, a new beginning, uh, and saying, what is God up to here? What do we hope to see in our church? You know, I, I don't know if I've mentioned this, but it's actually pretty helpful, um, I think, probably to think of what we're doing here as more of a church plant than a, a, a church. I, mean, I don't mean that theologically or anything, but just how we're doing things, what we're trying to do, thinking of it as a church plant this time for a, a new beginning. If you were here last week, you got to hear from Bill Malik, uh, and just what do we, how do we align ourselves with the, the, what the Spirit is already doing in this area? And so uh, it's helpful to think of this as a, a church plant. If you were planting a church, um, I don't know if any of you have or are planning to, but if you were, you'd usually do something called core team meetings or core team trainings. And so you can kind of think of this series as an inside family core team training mixed with a, a worship service uh, sermon series. And so we're just kind of coming together and say, what are we going to be about as a church? What do we hope to see in the next several years? What do we want to, where do we think God is working? And there's a few things that I just cannot get away from uh, that God has just stirred in my heart for this place and for this community. And, and one is, uh, I'll give them to you and then I'll explain them. One, deep community. Secondly, deep discipleship. And thirdly, what I'd call missional presence. So a deep community that we are following Jesus together. Being a Christian is not a solo sport. We are saved into a family. The cross comes with a community. So how do we live together in, in deep community? That's something we'll be hitting in this series. Next, deep discipleship. What I mean by that is transformation of the whole self. Not just the mind, not just the heart, not just the body, but all of ourselves following Jesus being transformed. Deep discipleship in, a, in contradiction or comparison to like shallow Christianity. You know, like, oh, we might know the right things in our head. We know all the write Bible answers, but it doesn't change us at all. We've only engaged the intellect. We haven't engaged the heart or the body or anything. So we want to be deep disciples of Jesus, where this we orient our whole life around following Jesus, not just a Sunday thing that we do, or like a hobby that we squeeze into our time, but a following Jesus actively as deep disciples. Lastly, missional presence proclaiming and embodying the gospel of Jesus from our neighborhoods to the nations. Oftentimes in churches, you're either really good at proclaiming uh, the gospel, like you'll evangelize, you'll share the gospel, you'll do all that, but you never actually live it or embody it. Or other, uh, it's easy in the church to be like all about like serving, 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 and serving the poor and all these things, but you never tell them why you're serving. You know, so you can see these two uh, different ends of the spectrum. But what I think we get in the New Testament and, and with Jesus is both proclaiming the gospel. The gospel is news, but also living it, embodying it, serving those around us from a heart that is grateful for the gospel. So we'll take just the next couple months in this series to kind of orient ourselves as a church uh, to try to get on the same page. Hopefully we'll be moving in the same direction as a body, as individuals, as a community. And uh, I hope this, is, this series is exciting for you. Uh, I, I think we should be ex both expectant of God to work and dependent on God to work. There's no silver bullet to make a difference in a community. There's no silver bullet to grow a church. Um, our job is to be in tune with what the Spirit is doing and to be obedient in that. And so today I just want to hone in on that idea of missional presence. How do we proclaim the gospel of Jesus, especially in a city like Missoula? You know, years ago, uh, when I first moved to Missoula, I was burdened about making disciples. I'm like, God, I, I know we're supposed to do this. I'm not really doing this. I'm not evangelizing. And so I just thought, you know, I'm just going to go get on one of the buses. So I like hop on one of the, you know, it's free, so on zero emissions. Um, but so I get on one of the local um, bus routes, and I don't really, I'm not good at public transportation, so I have no idea where I'm supposed to get off or how to ever get back. So I walked back, but uh, I rode the bus all the way down to Karis Park. 
And uh, I just wanted to, like, God, help me to know how to talk to people about Jesus. I don't know how to do this. And uh, I, I, I didn't know, and I just kind of kept chickening out. Finally, I go up to this lady. I'm like, can I pray for you? And she goes, um, no. <laughs> to be fair, it was dark downtown, and I was a strange man uh, coming up to a stranger. But, you know, it, it, that's, I think, how a lot of us feel when we're trying to proclaim the gospel or make disciples. We don't know what to do. We don't know where to start. Fast forward, maybe four or five years later, I'm down at Karis Park again. Something about Karis Park. I don't know. With uh, Taylor and Grayson, and I think my parents were there. And I noticed this older gentleman and a few others going around and talking to people. And I'm thinking, okay, here we go. Uh, and inevitably, he comes up to us, and he starts making small talk, conversation. But I'm, in the back of my mind, I'm like, I know where this is going, buddy. And uh, here I am a follower of Jesus, a pastor, and I'm uncomfortable hearing the gospel from somebody. And it wasn't because he wanted to talk about Jesus. I think it's more because his small talk felt like a bait and switch. Where it's like, I know, buddy, I know what you're doing. Like, you're just asking about my life and my family because you want to get to the, the important stuff. And so if it's hard to talk to a Christian, let alone a pastor about Jesus in Missoula, uh, how much more difficult is it to talk to an actual non-Christian, de-churched person, unchurched person about Jesus in Missoula? Now, hey, not to knock that guy, at least he was trying to be obedient in proclaiming the gospel, um, because many Christians were not. There was a recent Barna survey of millennials. I don't know why they're always picking on millennials, because um, I am one, but 96% of millennials said, Part of my faith means being a witness about Jesus. Okay, pretty high. 94% uh, of, of them said the best thing that could ever happen to someone is for them to come to know Jesus. Okay, millennials are looking pretty good. Uh, yet, 47% said it is wrong to share one's personal beliefs with someone of a different faith in hopes that they will one day share the same faith. Maybe you see the disconnect. This is the most important thing in the world to me. This would be the best thing for a friend or a family member or somebody that I know to give their life to. But I've bought into the lie that me trying to convince someone else of a belief is somehow intolerant and unloving. You know, if I said, if I came up to you and I was like, hey, you'll never guess. I had the best pizza in the world last night. And you were like, oh, that's amazing. Uh, where from? And I said, Oh, you're never going to believe it. This place called Little Caesars, it was only $5. You know, and if you were like, hey, I'm really happy for you, um, but can I bring you to like Biga Pizza downtown or somewhere else? Like, I'm happy you're excited about Little Caesars, but uh, can I also introduce you to another option? If that would not be unloving or intolerant for you to say, hey, that's awesome, but can I show you another option? In the same way, sharing our faith doesn't have to be pushy or awkward or car salesman-esque or disrespectful or rude. Instead, it can be genuine, winsome, and loving. But how do we do that? Well, let's learn from one of the best evangelists in the history of the church. will be in Acts 17. Acts is right after the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So if you want to go ahead and turn there, also it'll be on the screen. We'll be in uh, chapter 17, starting in verses, uh, verse 16. It says, while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was deeply distressed when he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with those who worshiped God, as well as in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some, some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also debated with him. Some said, what is this ignorant show-off trying to say? Others replied, he seems to be a preacher of foreign deities because he was telling the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. They took him and brought him to the Oropagus and said, may we learn about this new teaching you are presenting? Because what you say sounds strange to us, and we want to know what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners residing there spent their time on nothing else but telling or hearing something new. Paul stood in the middle of the Oropagus and said, People of Athens, I see that you are extremely religious in every respect. For as I was passing through and observing the objects of your worship, I even found an altar on which was inscribed to an unknown god. 
Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by human hands. Neither is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives everyone life and breath and all things. Verse 26, from one man he has made every nationality to live over the whole earth and has determined their appointed times and the boundaries of where they live. He did this so that they might seek God and perhaps they might reach out and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Since we are God's offspring, then, we shouldn't think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image fashioned by human arts and imagination. Therefore, having overlooked times of ignorance, God now commands all people everywhere to repent because he has set a day when he is going to judge the world in righteousness by the man he has appointed. He has provided proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some began to ridicule him, but others said, we'd like to hear from you again about this. So Paul left their presence. However, some people joined him and believed, including Dionysius, the Rapagite, a woman named Damaris, and others with them. One of my favorite passages in scripture. So Paul's in Athens on his second missionary journey, waiting for Silas and Timothy. And Paul Gould points out that Athens was one of the greatest cities of the ancient world. It was a center of intellectual and cultural achievement. Uh, great philosophers lived there, like Socrates and Plato and Aristotle. Uh, it also, Athens produced some of the best famous playwrights and historians. And so if you would take a walk through the marketplace, it would reveal, reveal all sorts of idols, indicative of their religious devotion and one could find temples for the worship of Roman Caesars, Greek and Roman gods, and countless other shrines and idols. There was a novelist at the time who wrote of Athens, said it is easier to meet a god in the street than a human. So Athens is this city full of false gods. The people there are chasing after these false things that ultimately won't satisfy them. And what is Paul's response to that? Verse 16 says he was deeply distressed when he saw that the city was full of idols. The New Living Translation says he was deeply troubled. It could literally be translated, his spirit was broken. It's like when you feel pain for somebody else. You know, a parent may feel pain for their child. You're, you're grieved. It's not because you don't care. It's because you do care because you want better for that person or that child. You know, it's not that you're superior and they're inferior, like judging from your high horse, uh, but you love that person and it hurts you to see them chasing the wrong things. You genuinely want the best for them. So first, what we can learn from Paul is that he cared deeply about the city. Otherwise, he wouldn't be distressed, especially not deeply distressed. And I just want to ask, is that our posture towards Missoula? When you go around Missoula and you see streets filled with modern-day idols, you see propaganda signs in people's windows that you don't agree with, you see people living in a way that is contrary to the ways of God, what is your response Maybe you have coworkers or neighbors that live in a way that you don't agree with. What is your response? What happens in your spirit? Do you want to be cynical towards the people of Missoula, towards the city of Missoula? Ah, oh, Missoula is going to hell in a handbasket. Or I miss the good old days of Missoula. And it's okay to be angry about the things that we see, but our anger has to come from a heart of love that is broken for the people. Of, of caring, of wanting what's best for the people of Missoula. You know, sometimes I walk around and my heart breaks in the city 
Because people are chasing after modern day idols, false gods. They think, you know, once I get this, then I'll be okay. Or once I get that adventure, then I'll be fulfilled. Or once I do this, or one more of this. And they, they, we numb themselves. They distract themselves one thing to the next. But our response to what we see in the city has to be a posture of caring love. If we are proclaiming the gospel without a posture of love in our heart for the people of Missoula, we have no business proclaiming the gospel. Secondly, what do we learn from Paul about how to proclaim the gospel in our city? Verse 22 and 23 says, Paul stood in the middle of the Oropagus, which was a, both a large rocky kind of outcropping where leaders met to debate. You know, the official council of the city was called the Oropagus, but it was also the, it was the place and the people. And so he stood in the middle of that space in front of those people and said, people of Athens, I see that you are extremely religious in every respect. For as I was passing through and observing the objects of your worship, I even found an altar on which was inscribed to an unknown God. So he stands in front of these people in this place that where debates would take place, and he, he talks to them about what he observed in their city. He says, I see you're extremely religious. I was walking around the marketplace, and I saw these things. I observed all of these idols. What we can learn is Paul was a student of that city and that culture. Paul was a student of that city and that culture, and we must do the same. Because our culture is changing so quickly, even in Montana, of all places. You know, it's become even more difficult or, like we mentioned, taboo to talk about Jesus. In 1936, there was a missionary named Leslie Newbegin who left Great Britain to be a missionary in India. And he was there for almost four decades. And when he came back in 1974, he realized how his home country was now more of a mission field than India was when he left. Because Western culture had changed so much in those decades. Where he said, other than Islam, this is the most resistant culture to the gospel. And his critique was that the church hadn't responded appropriately appropriately to all of those changes. So they were trying to preach the unchanging gospel to a culture that actually didn't really exist anymore. And he asked this in his book, Foolishness to the Greeks, what would be involved in a missionary encounter between the gospel and this whole way of perceiving, thinking, and living that we call modern Western culture? That's the question we can be asking. What would it take for us to have a genuine missionary encounter, in his words, between the gospel that does not change and the culture that is constantly changing and how it's perceiving, thinking, and living, what we would call modern Western culture? If that was true in the 70s, In Great Britain, it is certainly true of our culture in 2024. If the culture changed so much in those about four decades, how much has it changed since 74 to 24, which I'm not good at math, but is five decades, I believe. You know, culture has changed so rapidly, and we need to be good missionaries to learn how to best proclaim the gospel in the city we are called to. We are called to a people and a place. But many Christians, we're not students of the culture we live in. We're critics only. You know, we're, our church is part of a family of churches known as the Christian and Missionary Alliance. And we put people through intense cultural training and language study to send them out as missionaries across the globe. Because you can't just go to some other country and start importing your culture on them. That's not missions. Your job as a missionary is to distill the gospel free of your own preferences and cultural add-ons and then learn as much as you can about the culture you are going to and the language of where you are going so you can translate the gospel, proclaim the gospel in a way that best makes sense in that culture. Hudson Taylor was one of the first well-known missionaries to do this. He was a missionary to China and one of the first to realize that he should live and dress like the people he went to serve. Now that's a commonplace idea amongst uh, missions, but he took a lot of criticism for it at the time. 
And, but the idea was this act of love and understanding, saying, I want to best understand you and live like you so that I can best proclaim the gospel in a way that makes sense to you and not import all my Western ideas or whatever personal preferences onto you, but the gospel, free of everything else, the gospel. So it's assumed if you're an international missionary, especially in our denomination, that you're going to spend years of language study uh, and understanding culture in order to best proclaim the gospel in that context. But, come back to the United States, we often give little thought or understanding to the city or culture that we live in. Instead, we just become critics of it, and we refuse to change. We think, if people want to come to church, they can come to church, but we're not changing for them. Well, actually, it's our job to be a student of our city and our culture and our context so that we can best know how to communicate the gospel in a way that makes sense to people that are outside of the church. You know, Paul understood the city enough that he could speak the language of it and proclaim the gospel in a way that makes sense to them. Notice he quoted their poets. He understood their culture. He understood what was important to them. If we want to tell people in Missoula about Jesus, we need to try and understand the culture of Missoula. What are people's longings here? What are their hopes? What are their thoughts on Christianity or spirituality? What are their objections to Christianity? What's the spiritual climate of this city, of this valley? What are the modern-day idols that people fall for, that they worship? You know, because of the speed of technology and globalism, people of Missoula, you know, are now consuming the same ideas in media as people in more bigger progressive cities like New York or LA or Seattle or whatever. And, you know, we're th we thought Montana was a little more sheltered. Well, it's not so true anymore. And maybe Missoula was always a little unique compared to the rest of, you know, uh, Montana. I think that's fair to say. But we need to be students of Missoula in the larger Western culture that's being adopted. And so what are some of the cultural or spiritual conversations that are trickling their way down into the people of our city? You know, a, a quick overview of maybe the last several decades um, of the different stages that the, the church and belief of spirituality in Jesus has gone through is, I, you know, I'd start with maybe what I'd call the good old days stage. You know, where Christianity used to be very mainstream, popular, assumed, people that weren't Christians, they just kind of needed to connect the religious dots. You know, you'd be like, hey, you're, you're a sinner. You're like, yeah, I know, and you need to accept Jesus, and bada bing, bada boom. You know, you had evangelists like Billy Graham, that sort of style. Then you, you kind of uh, went into what I call maybe the, the truth stage, where even late 20th century, people are starting to wonder, wait, why is Christianity the true religion? So, like, apologetics became pretty evidence-based, you know, evidence for the resurrection. You had books like The Case for Christ by Lee Strobel. Because people want to know, wait, why is this true? It's still assumed, but wait, why? And then you kind of went to maybe what I call the cool stage, uh, where, yeah, okay, it's true. There's lots of evidence, but it's so boring, you know? Church is so boring. Not this church, other churches. Uh, but so the church was like, okay, let's make church cool, Right? So the attractional model kind of came in, the, where you got the fog and the skinny jeans and the strobe lights. And, you know, I joke, it's I, honestly not all bad. Your church should match the context that it's in. But cool doesn't last. Amen? Um, and then what we've kind of come into now, I think we've gone through that stage. I, I, I don't know what to call this next stage. I, I wrote the disenchanted moral stage, where people think, okay, maybe, yeah, Christianity is true. Maybe. But is it good? Is it good for the world? Is it good for me? Is it moral? What about all the fallen church leaders? What about the hypocrisy of the church? Or it's kind of this thinking like, we don't need Jesus anymore. We'll take some of his ideas, human rights, compassion, etc. But we'll kind of kick him out. We want the kingdom. We don't want the king. And we're so uh, disenchanted as a culture where we think all that exists is what you can see or touch. There's no greater divine narrative that we're living into, no divine story, no spiritual realm at all. We live in what Charles Taylor called the imminent frame, which is this, this 
term for an enclosed reality where all that exists is the material, natural world. Meaning is found within the confines only of this world without any reference to any sort of transcendence. This naturalistic, materialistic, humanistic world where we're, we're just totally on our own. And uh, Paul Gould points out four common objections within this framework today, four common objections to our beliefs. One, the idea that science somehow disproves God. So these are the things that are our culture, probably people in our city, are thinking when we want to proclaim the gospel of Jesus. One, science, hasn't science disproven God? Two, isn't belief in Jesus as the one and only God kind of intolerant? Three, if there is a God, I don't think he's good. What about all the Old Testament stories? And four, that Christianity offers an archaic, repressive, unloving ethic when it comes to human sexuality, marriage, the poor, race, etc. This is the world that we are living in, in the one we are called still to talk to others about Jesus in. What we can learn from Paul is to be a student of our city in order to proclaim the gospel well, to understand the people around us, our friends, our coworkers, our city at large. What's underneath the surface? What are they really longing for? What do they believe? And we must consider some of the, the roadblocks in our city. So uh, we lived, we did a couple years in living in small town South Dakota. And there's not much I miss about living in small town South Dakota, but there is one thing. I miss being bored. I know that sounds weird, but I told that to Taylor the other day. I was like, I just, there's just so much going on all the time. And I was like, I just miss living in this little town where nothing's going on ever. And there's just like no pressure to do all these things. And because Missoula, kind of like Athens, is like entertainment central, you know, especially for Montana, where there's concerts and races and farmers markets and grizz games and so many brunch places to try and breweries. Not that I would go, but, you know, other people. Mountain biking, hiking, fishing, floating, events, events, events. And when I was living in Helena before I moved to Missoula originally, uh, I was thinking of moving to Missoula. I was reading about it online, and one woman on like a forum or something said that when she lived here, she was, quote, literally never once bored, which is part of what makes Missoula amazing. Like, there's so much stuff to do. But at the same time, we can constantly keep ourselves distracted. And I think that's part of the challenge of being a Christian in Missoula. You know, you could go to church, be in community with one another, serve, spend time with God, or you could go to the Kettle House Amphitheater every night, which is an amazing place. Not to mention the constant entertainment that we have in the palm of our hand where we're just, we're just distracted, distracted, distracted. It's hard for us as Christians. Imagine somebody that has no concept of a spiritual realm at all. You know, I'm not against any of those fun things. I love fun things. I'm just saying it grieves me that we are so busy as a culture, as a city, that we don't have time to consider the deeper existential questions of life. Is this all there is? Is there more? Is there a God? If so, what is his posture towards me? We can just distract ourselves for literally our whole life. So it becomes difficult for us as Christian witnesses in a city that always has something going on, and people don't ever stop to consider those sorts of things. Next, what else do we learn from Paul? Paul found a shared starting point. He found common ground. For them, it was their worship to an unknown God and that they were religious and these, these poets that he referenced, but Paul built a bridge to that. He says, I see you're extremely religious in every respect, for as I was passing through and observing, I found an altar which was inscribed to an unknown God. So he doesn't just come in guns ablazing, which some of us do nowadays, uh, but he finds commonality, and he explains the missing link for them. And in the same way, we should find similar starting points in our Athens, in our Missoula. What do people care about here? That's good. What are the universal longings of the human heart. We all desire truth and goodness and beauty. There's a starting point. 
In the book Winsome Persuasion, the authors say the key to crafting a successful message is to find starting points consisting of beliefs that the strong public already find plausible. Meaning finding common ground. What's, what are our city's sacred core values? Freedom, conservation, recreation, human rights, whatever it may be. Or it could look like us finding a, this mutual desire or longing or suggesting how the gospel actually fills that longing. Or we could say, like Paul, people of Missoula, I see you really care about human rights. I do too. Why do you? I'm just wondering why, why you do. Where did that idea come from if we're just kind of here from survival of the fittest, you know? Did we learn that from watching nature? Why do you believe in that? Because I think you're right. I actually think Jesus gives us the best foundation for human rights because we're all made in the image of God. Or you could say, people of Missoula, I see you really care about conservation of our wilderness areas and our hiking trails and our wildlife. I do too, but why do you? I do because that was actually the first command God gave to humankind in the Garden of Eden to have dominion over the landscape and animals and to take care of them. That's what it means to be a Christian. Not only that, but the good news of Jesus is that our conservation efforts actually aren't in vain. Even creation is going to be redeemed. Paul says in Romans 8, creation itself will be set free from the bondage to decay and the glorious freedom of God's children. Or you could say, hey, you have those moments when you're mountain biking or backpacking through the Bob Marshall or floating the river, where you have those thin moments where you feel this touch of the universe and you're tempted to wonder, is there more? Well, let me introduce you not to the universe, but the creator of the universe. You know, what if it's the glory of God and the beauty of God that you feel in those moments rather than some random, meaningless, biological response that must have helped serve our ancestors' survival in the past? What if? You know, what if? Just throwing it out there. But we need to find common ground. What do they care about? A lot of things our culture cares about, they've taken from Christianity and just hijacked and twisted human rights, compassion, freedom. So much of the Western civilization that we live in comes from this. We just twist it. So there are tons of common starting points with the people of our city and Western civilization as a whole. So to be good evangelists, we can learn from Paul to find common starting points to build bridges. I'm not saying you guys all have to be scholars of Western civilization, but just to find what do they care about? How can you translate that back to the gospel of Jesus Christ to build a bridge? And lastly, it's important to see some responded and some scoffed. Some, some began to ridicule him, it says. So some ridiculed him. Others said, we'd like to hear from you again. They had more questions. And others joined him and believed. Think about that. The second greatest evangelist in the history of the church had a mixed vague reaction. Some wanted to hear more, some believed, and some began to ridicule him. If that was true in this enchanted age of the first century where they believed in the religious and spiritual, how much more true is it in our disenchanted age where people aren't even sure if they believe in God at all? You know, I, I pray for revival in our city and in our neighborhood, and we should, and on our university. Uh, what's more common is that some believed and some rolled their eyes. Our job, like Paul, is to scatter the seed and where we can try to till the soil. But ultimately, God gives the growth. You can't force anyone to believe. That doesn't mean we should be sloppy or not put any time or study into our evangelism into proclaiming the gospel, but it means at the end of the day, it's out of our control. Our job is to be obedient. Even if you give a masterful address like Paul, still some will scoff, some will have questions, and God willing, some will believe. So in closing, practically, how can we live like Paul in Athens? 
How can we love Missoula well? Doesn't mean we agree with everything here. Of course not. But how can we love the people in the city well? How can we become students of it? You know, I've had several of you ask since our time here, how are we going to grow as a church? And uh, we, we're walking through this sort of replanting process, which is part of the answer. But the main answer after God adds to their number daily is through you all, through you guys, through me, through our family, us as both a community and as individuals. You know, gone are the days for the most part when people, when most people at least, would just show up to church on their own, when there was social capital to going to church. You know, pastors in uh, Christendom, they didn't even have to go out and evangelize. Uh, in Geneva in the 16th century, John Calvin, he didn't have to go invite people to church or to share the gospel. It was the law to go. You know, kind of like kids, it was like a loose law, but like kids have to go to school, you know? Can you imagine all of our public school teachers out in the streets trying to persuade people of why they should go to school and get educated? No, that's what it was like in the past for the church. Like, it was not just culturally, cultural norm, it was a law to go. We're living in a very different time. But there's a cost to following Jesus. There's a cost to being part of a church community. There is no social capital. If anything, there's probably the opposite. You know, while people may not show up to church on their own accord, many are actually surprisingly pretty open to coming if invited. Uh, one, another Barna survey said 2% of church-going people will invite someone to church in a given year. 2% for the whole year. 73% of unchurched adults in the U.S. say they were never invited to church in a given year. 82% of those said if invited by a trusted friend or relative, 82% of the unchurched, which are those who have not attended a service in the past six months, 82% are likely to attend the church. Now, I'm not good at math, as I mentioned, but if 50 of us invited two unchurched people that trusted us, that would mean we could have 82 guests show up on those Sundays that they were invited. Now, so the problem isn't just, oh, our culture, our culture, our culture. The problem for, for it also is on us. We're not proclaiming the gospel at all, many of us. And that's not a guilt trip in any sense of the word. I'm saying we should be excited that people would be that responsive to being invited to some sort of church function or Sunday gathering. So what's one small step we can all take? I know we covered a lot. What's one small step we can all take, no matter where we are on our walk with Jesus? Before we proclaim, we can pray. One person said, evangelism is joining a conversation the Holy Spirit is already having with someone. Meaning God is already aware of the people in our city and in our neighborhoods and pursuing them. It wasn't our idea to pursue them. God is already on mission. So it starts with us joining what God is doing through prayer. If you came in, you probably saw a little bingo card on your chair. Uh, just kidding. Those are prayer cards. And uh, there's, there's three slots, there's directions on the back in case you get confused. But uh, just to write down three names today or this week. They could be friends. They could be family. They could be coworkers. They could be neighbors. Think of three people in your life, in your circle of influence, and write their names down. And then put it somewhere you'll see it every day. Maybe that's on your dash. Maybe that's on your mirror. And just for the next 21 days, three weeks, every day, pray for them. And let's just see what happens. Pray that God would make himself obvious to them. Pray that their, their uh, suppression of the truth they would reside and they would be awakened to their deeper longings and desires. Pray that you could have a meaningful conversation with them. And pray that their heart would be softened to see the beauty of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So whether you feel like you're ready to go in front of Missoula and give this evangelism master class like Paul, you know, you're trying to find a spot on the campus to already do that. That's great if you're there. Or maybe you're scared to death of people even knowing you actually believe this stuff. Wherever you are on the spectrum, the starting point for us all is prayer. 
Who are three people in our lives that we can commit to praying for for the next three weeks? Worship team, you can come back up. Church, if we are going to have any chance of making a difference in this world and in this city, we need to be willing to proclaim and embody the gospel in Missoula. We can do this by caring about Missoula, becoming a student of Missoula, and finding common ground with the people of Missoula, knowing all well that some will scoff, some may have questions, and by the grace of God, some may believe. And that's exactly the posture that Jesus took towards us. Let's pray, and then we're going to take communion together as a church. Father, we thank you that you are pursuing this city. We thank you that you are a missional God. And you don't need us, but you invite us. You don't need us to do this, but you use us. God, you've prepared good works in advance for us to do. May we walk in them. God, may you stir in the the hearts of those three people that you bring to mind. May you bring to mind those three people that we have influence in their lives, that they trust us, that we can build relationships with them. And may we as a church, just broken people, none of us evangelists like Paul, just ordinary people wanting to be obedient, God, would you give us opportunities to do so? Whether that feels messy, whether we, we, we give a gospel presentation and we kick ourselves for what we said wrong or should didn't say, God, may you just lead us as individuals and as a community as a whole to proclaim the good news of Jesus in this beautiful, tragic city that we call home. Pray all these things in your name. Amen.